Okay, <clears throat> let's pull up the slideshow. Let's leave it here. All right, welcome back, Kim. You're muted. Thanks, it's good to be back. <laughs> um, please note this, um, the Q&A portion will be recorded and that has started. So Kim, we have um, a lot of questions coming in already. Um, and you know, again, uh, to our audience, just encourage you to keep those questions coming. So the first one here is from Devorah. Um, Devorah asks, how do we deal with the commodities pricing? Or sorry, how do we deal with commodities pricing? Isn't that the quote elephant in the room? That's a great question. And, um, and it's one that I think the answer to which probably depends a lot on uh, what your role is. So Devorah, I don't know what your role is. And, um, and I know a little bit about the group from the poll that we ran at the beginning of the hour here. But, um, you know, the, when we look at the problem statement for the price crisis response, and we think about reimagining purchasing practices, we are in some ways contrasting coffee purchasing for specialty coffee or best practices or recommendations with the idea of a commercial standard for coffee and the commodity futures market as a, as a market for coffee worldwide and a, and a price index. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we did does contrast what we believe is a more sustainable way of buying, way of building value chains with that, you know, standard um, way of, of buying and selling or finding someone in the marketplace. But it was also important to us to recognize that you know, not everyone has the option of leaving that commodity futures market entirely. And that was especially true um, as we started to talk to more and more producers in this process, um, many of whom are eager to sell as much coffee as possible to specialty buyers directly to forge relationships, you know, to use all of these alternative marketplaces, but don't necessarily have access to those for 100% of their coffee. So while that might be something that uh, a buyer can choose to do or can at least aspire to do, um, and that there may be you know, challenges that they face along the way, I don't mean to make it seem like it's, it's easy to only engage in really high value specialty coffee business, um, but that is something that might not even be an option for many of the specialty coffee producers and stakeholders on the production side that we were really looking to, um, to include in this work as well. So I think there's a, the answer to the question probably is something to the effect of like, um, it depends or, or both and that yes, we should be addressing the, um, the commodity futures market and the power that it has and, um, and recognizing where we are with relation, in relation to it individually um, and then seeking ways that we individually in, our, in the relationships that we have but then also as a community um, of specialty coffee um, actors can employ strategies that move us farther away from that without you know, using the resources that we have to try to dismantle something that you know, even in its creation, at least there was a, a thinking um, that this was a, a tool that would offer some stability. So, um, in the past, you know, it, it serves many functions. And I think that our our greatest opportunity here is to recognize what it can do and then seek to build alternatives from it. We have another question here from Augusto. Do you think it is important to have a value chain per region or per country, considering that each quote force of the value chain could have a different impact? according to the place. Yeah, it is something that I've, I've really grappled with and I know that everyone who's been involved in developing this map, so 
people who are part of the price crisis response initiative, but others and our staff, peer reviewers, um, to try to find that balance between what is unique about every value chain and what is universal or close to it for coffee, specialty coffee value chains. Um, so where I you know that I first get caught up when thinking about uh, how universal this can be, and you know, I recognize that we're making an assumption in this systems map that the coffee is going to be exported and imported, which immediately already assumes that this is a not a domestic supply chain. You know, that the the buyer of the coffee or the consumer of the coffee and the producer of the coffee don't live in the same country or else you wouldn't have this export import thing happening. So, you know, that's a big assumption. And I think that um, if we were to look at every country individually, uh, it would be a, a really interesting exercise to have a, a group that works in a place, you know, whether that's like a, a chapter of the SCA or um, a coffee institution that represents uh, coffee growers in a, in a particular geography, take a map like this and, um, and tweak it to fit local realities, where it may be that some actors appear on a map in Rwanda that would not appear on a map for Costa Rica, or that would appear on a map for you know, Japan that don't appear on a map for the United States. So I think that um, there's a lot that we can do with this map. We could take each one of those actors around the outside of the wheel and um, and go into a lot of detail about who is comprised in that, you know, something like skilled labor, like how many different roles um, does that category comprise? Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's, that's not work that we've done yet, but there's a absolutely opportunity there. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Daniel or Danielle. After mapping all the actors in the coffee industry, what's next? Yesterday, there was a webinar that talked about the buying guide and how to achieve fair price for the whole chain. What have you made in these topics? Yeah, what's next? Um, so uh, as I said, this this marks kind of the, the beginning or a significant milestone along this journey, but um, contained in that price crisis response report are um, a few different things that we see at the very least as standalone um, knowledge products or uh, or the launch point for new initiatives um, and for new new thinking. And, uh, and so our recommendations, which are toward the end of the document, are probably the, the best example of that, other than maybe this systems map inspired by the, um, the work as well. So, you know, within the recommendations are probably 10 or 15 different ideas that could turn into something like a buyer's guide or a, um, a working group on a topic like living income or on new business models. Um, you know, even in those things that I just said, I, it wouldn't have to be just one, you know, that we would uh, say that there is one buyer's guide to end all, all buyer's guides. So the question that, that we have now is based on these recommendations, as we share this information and we um, raise the general awareness of the work that we've done and ensure that um, we have made the background accessible um, to choose based on the, the interest that we get, the, uh, the opportunities that are out there, where are we going to focus our attention? You know, what kind of initiatives are we going to convene around so that um, a year from now, you know, we're talking about how the price crisis response work inspired us to launch this new um, think tank. And then from there, you know, we uh, set out a list of um, of goals or a uh, a list of needs that the association or the association in concert with other organizations, um, you know, partnering institutions or a, a really enthusiastic group of buyers, um, you know, uh, could 
undertake to to establish something new. And so I think that when I, I said in the presentation that this work is going to be going on for weeks, months, and years, um, that some of these ideas, if they are about that bigger scale, longer term change, um, will have iterations that go on and grow, I hope, and uh, and build for, for years to come. Thank you. And um, this is kind of related. I was going to save this one toward the end, but we're touching on it now. This question is from Don. Um, thank you for the webinar. Could you please comment on the plans for the future um, of the PCR? So I think you kind of did, but there's, I think, maybe a couple things, more things you might want to add here. Yeah. Um, so I, I alluded to this uh, in the presentation, but um, uh, uh, when we finished this year of work, uh, we presented as a, a price crisis response team, and Ellie and I were both part of that team together, um, we presented this summary of work in a less polished document to our board of directors for the association for them to read and ultimately to adopt into our five-year strategy for the association. And the way in which it was adopted was as the foundation for our sustainable specialty coffee agenda. Um, so over the next five years, one of the objectives of the entire organization, again, I said, not just the sustainability department, but through our events and our research and our education is to drive a sustainable specialty coffee agenda. And so you know, this price crisis response work led us to all sorts of different insights, but the, the really major conclusion that we feel like you know, we can't, you know, what we can't not do is to address the creation of value and the equitable distribution of value in specialty in the specialty coffee value chain um, and the the industry writ large. So um, that will be the the core of this sustainable specialty coffee agenda, which over five years will be you know integrating into these activities that you all know our association for doing. You know, whether those are events, um, including online events, you know, and uh, and education and research and um, and others. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Emilio. Emilio, where did um, where did where did you identify the biggest equality challenges in the map? Hmm. Wow. I don't know. I think I can comment on that too. Maybe I've had a little bit longer to think about it because I'm reading the questions. But I, um, I mean, one of the challenges that we saw was also just how to engage contributors equitably across the value system. And so I think even we, you know, we specifically had convenings in a producing environment and, and that was very, it was really, really important. And we, we realized that going in, but also reaffirmed it um, on the completion of that event in Brazil. And knowing that where, whereas I do think we um, have a good faith effort to reach uh, participants in different countries and making sure that we have gender equity and just different balance, um, in some cases, we really had to work extra hard to reach out to different geographies that we felt like we hadn't really heard from. And then the peer review process did that as well as it gave a chance for people to opt in. Um, and so I would say, like, I don't have a specific answer, but I know that it is something that we see as a challenge, even with just getting the right feedback. And so um, really, I would say probably every, everywhere yeah. in, the, in the map. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there are, uh, if we look, think about that orange and green map and the, uh, the slide that, that talked about the concentration of, um, of decision-making power among fewer actors in the middle of that chain, um, that the number of people on the end versus the middle does, I think, inevitably say something about a challenge to equity. Um, but I also think that a lot of that right now is speculative, unless we have done some more work than at present we have to define what we mean by value. Because when we talk about equitable distribution of value, of course, you know, we are talking about financial value, economic value. Um, but we all recognized also that there are other ways in which value is expressed, you know, other kinds of reward. Um, and I think that anyone who's been 
at part of a uh, value chain that is based on or predicated on a relationship knows that that relationship is uh, is something that is additional. And you know, we can even take that outside of the context of the coffee value chain. Um, we could be talking about a, a local value chain for some other product of which we're all consumers and none of us is a producer, that um, there are different ways in which we, um, we measure value and that the association and, and the broader community um, has some work. And I think it's some exciting and meaningful work to do around articulating what it is that we mean when we say value distribution and not just the, the financial part. So I would say that's, um, that's what gives me pause here is to, to think about those other kinds of value. And, um, and one more thing that I think is, is really interesting and has really been laid bare by the current pandemic is um, how sometimes the search for equitable value distribution and, and equity, it might be, as we look at the coffee value chain, we might see it the most between actors, you know, so between one stage and another, importing and roasting, or between um, buyers and sellers of coffee. But th that kind of, uh, the need for equity exists within an actor, you know, if an actor is a, a firm, like a, within a roasting company or within an importing company or within um, any one of these stages or these activities or actors, there's a, an equity need and opportunity there too to be addressed. So I think that um, the more holistic we attempt to be, of course, the more complex it gets, uh, but that it would also be, you know, short-sighted to only try to advocate for one group, one actor versus another, or one you know, activity versus another activity, and not also see the, the need that may exist you know, within one company. Um, this is a good time to mention that we um, invite our audience to complete a um, post and evaluation uh, through SurveyMonkey. So there will be a chat message that's going to be displayed in about a minute that you will have a link but also when you exit the webinar the survey should pop up automatically um, and if you have attended previous webinars i understand that there was a glitch yesterday in case anyone experienced that we have fixed it so it wouldn't allow you to uh, fill it out again um, just in case anyone was worried about that because it did happen yesterday um, it has been fixed so um, in closing um, i wanted to um, go to this question from Anne Marie, because I liked it so much. Um, the evolved coffee value chain is an important tool for education, but perhaps still too complex for many young part time baristas. How do you recommend educating on the basics of the supply chain without oversimplifying? That is a great question. And I'm really eager, um, once we publish this, to start getting feedback from um, some of the people who are using it on a, a daily basis as to what resonates and what is a, a narrative that both speaks to this complexity, but also um, you know makes it comprehensible, like I said. So uh, I would say that when I look at it now and based on the conversations that I've had, which have been you know, numerous, um, introducing the, the uh, price crisis response map to our staff and some stakeholders that weren't part of the price crisis response initiative themselves, um, trying to evolve it, trying to identify, you know, what do we need to keep and what should probably wait until a, a future more detailed exploration of one piece of the map. You know, we made a lot of compromises um, along the way. But, um, and, and so in those conversations, I think that uh, what's emerged to me is that there's a, a little bit of a, a hierarchy or there's a kind of um, a, a narrative for explaining the central column, which again is, is not unfamiliar. It's not that different from that original seed to cup diagram and having in this case, six stages. Um, so that's still a place to begin. It's just, um, you know, not the place to end. So if there's a, you know, a need to, to simplify or, or where to get started, um, start in the, in the middle. You know, you can start with any one of those stages, depending on where the, the person that you're talking to is coming from. Um, and that be, be really different given the diversity of this uh, this audience here on the webinar. 
but uh, starting in the center column and then at the very least just identifying that in order for that central column to exist and to function there are all of these other actors and we can ignore those for now you know we can uh, we can talk about them in our next conversation but uh, at the beginning just know that uh, these are the activities to learn first but not to forget that uh, there's all of this this whole network supports that that chain that column to um, to be able to stand All right, well, I think we have time for just like a really quick one, which is where can I get this material, the poster especially, this question from Bruna. So that will be, um, uh, it will be available on our website. Uh, it will be a poster. Um, it's, you know, not uh, not dissimilar in, in some ways stylistically from our SCA flavor wheel. Um, so we will be making a poster out of this too. You know, our original intention was to uh, launch this system map in order to make the poster available at the Expo store in Portland. So um, that's part of the reason why having this uh, this lecture and, and having this map you know, so close to, to being launched was, uh, was important to us. Um, so within the next couple of weeks, we'll have this available for, um, for purchase in on our website and also um, you know something that people can view and zoom in on. I promise that uh, that it won't always be this tiny, and you'll be able to um, to see it and uh, and read about it. And uh, and also, as I said in response to the last question, the um, the feedback that we get will be really invaluable because um, this is the the first time that we've done something like this. We've, we're not replacing an older SCA system map or um, or you know seed to cup. Uh, diagram. This is the the first time that we've done something like this, um, but I expect that as we learn more, um, and also potentially as these categories change. I talked about the domestic consumption value chain looking really different from this one. Um, as as we continue to evolve as an industry, I think that the map that we look to as a representation should also continue to evolve and uh, and you know feedback from as diverse an array of actors as possible will um, will inform those future directions. Okay. Well, that takes us to the top of the hour and therefore concludes this lecture. Thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you, Kim, for speaking. And thank you to Pacific Barista Series for supporting Expo Weekend Lectures. Um, everyone, please be sure to fill out the post lecture survey by the link following this lecture and coming in the post lecture email and enjoy the rest of the lectures and workshops that you choose to attend. Thank you. Thank you so much.